All right, man, peace. You know, brothers, it's very important that when we make our assessments and our evaluations about certain things that we encounter in life, that we place them in their proper context. Because if we cannot contextualize the things that we assess, we're doing ourselves and the thing that we're assessing an injustice. Like say, for example, you have two children and one of them normally brings home a report card that's filled with C minuses. Well, if they bring home a report card that has B pluses, now you're happy with them. But if you have another child who normally brings home A pluses and their report card has B pluses, you're unhappy with them. Both children got the same B plus, but because of the context, that's what determines your evaluation. Why am I saying all this? Because Mr. Steph Curry, and I did a video on him a couple of weeks before the finals ended in which I stated that the media was lying on Steph Curry, especially pertaining to the narrative that he was quote unquote not clutch in the playoffs. Now is Steph Curry as clutch as a Michael Jordan or Kawhi Leonard like historically clutch in the playoffs? No, he's not. And of course, I'm very aware of the stat that says he's 0 for 8 in crunch time situations where he can hit a basket to tie or take the lead. I get it. I get it. But we have to contextualize Steph Curry. He is by far the most impactful player in the history of the NBA under 6'3". There's never been a player in the history of the league who was evaluated on a Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Hakeem Olajuwon scale that is of the stature of Steph Curry. Never in history. And the only player that I would say in the modern era we expected as much offensive output from as we do from Steph Curry in big playoff games was Allen Iverson. And Iverson only had one great playoff run in his entire career. His fans still hang their hat on that one 2001 playoff run. That's a whole other video for another day because as I've stated in the past, if there's one basketball fan base that's even more toxic than the Kobe Bryant fan base, it's the Allen Iverson fan base. But that's neither here nor there. Just to get back to the point, Max Kellerman is going to go about lambasting Steph Curry, as is Kendrick Perkins, and I'm not quite sure if they understand what they're saying, because they're trying to base it off of a standard that we would normally hold a Michael Jordan to, a LeBron James to, a Kobe Bryant to. We expect those players to average about 36 and 6 in their playoff runs, at the very least, shooting somewhere in that 45 to 52% range. That's what we expect from players of that ilk. When we look at the last 30 years, we say to ourselves, Michael Jordan, Hakeem Olajuwon, Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, LeBron James, Kevin Durant have had the most memorable playoff runs of any players of the modern era. You could probably throw Tim Duncan in there as well for his 2003 run. Steph Curry would be the only player, if we were to include him in that group, to be as slight of stature as he is, as small as he is, and as incapable of dominating a game just from physicality as he would be. That's why I said you have to evaluate him on a different scale. And even though I have, say for example, I have Isaiah Thomas in my top 15 players of all time, and certain people would argue that he should be in the top 10 players of all time. I have him in my top 15 because as I've already stated, I think that he's still the greatest small man of all time. Steph Curry is right there nipping on his heels. And had, for example, had the Golden State Warriors won the finals this year and Steph Curry won the MVP, I would have probably had to put him right there with Isaiah Thomas. I would have probably had to knock someone out of my top 15 to put Steph Curry in there. And no, I would not have knocked out Kobe Bryant. For the Kobe Bryant fanboys out there, no, I would not have knocked him out had I had to put Steph Curry in the top 15. My point being is this. Steph Curry has to be assessed on a whole other level. And to be quite honest with you, If you were to go back and revisit Isaiah Thomas' playoff career in the 1980s, he was nowhere near as dominant as you would think. I mean, the standard that we hold Steph to, which is average 28 to 32 points a game, shoot 50%, make all the big shots, we've never held a small man to that standard in the history of NBA evaluation, ever. And that is truly a compliment to Steph Curry. That's, That's not a slight. That's not a critique. These people here, they think that they're critiquing Steph Curry when they hold him to a Michael Jordan, LeBron James standard. They're really giving him a great compliment. It's like when I talk about Floyd Mayweather and people say, well, you know, Floyd Mayweather would never be Sugar Ray Leonard. He would never be Tommy Hearns. You have to understand, Sugar Ray Leonard and Tommy Hearns, their prime weight class was welterweight. Floyd Mayweather's prime weight class was 130 pounds, okay? Junior lightweight. So you're comparing a natural junior lightweight to a natural welterweight that in and of itself is a great compliment and a lot of people just don't understand that 
So anyway, they're going to talk about it, and I'm going to chime in. Start the debate now, Kai. It's the question. Sure. Okay, thanks for hijacking that, guys. Uh, what did we learn about Steph Curry during these finals? What I learned about Steph Curry, and I can't speak for everyone else, but what I learned about Steph Curry is something that I've already known. That being that he is an extremely impactful offensive player, arguably the most impactful offensive player of all time, but he's not physically dominant. You can take him out of his game mentally, but when he's locked in, he's probably the most potent offensive force in the last 15 years in the NBA. That's what he is. But the way that they defend Steph Curry, and this is, this is the issue that I have with many of these television pundits when they talk about basketball. They'll say that Steph Curry did not play well in Game 6 against the Toronto Raptors. Let's understand that the Toronto Raptors have a historically great defense. When I say historically great, not just stat-wise, but when you look at their roster of players and the accolades that have been accrued unto them, whether it's Kawhi Leonard, a two-time defensive player of the year, or Marcus Gasol, a one-time defensive player of the year, or Pascal Siakam, a player who is going to make all NBA defensive teams for years to come. I mean, that team has historically great defensive talent. They probably have the most defensive talent on their squad of any team, maybe since the 08 Celtics or the 04 Pistons. I mean, that's how talented they are on the defensive end and very long. So it's always going to be difficult for a player like a Steph Curry to dominate against them. But their defensive scheme was totally centered on him. So it's difficult to compare his output versus Klay Thompson's output because Klay Thompson is not someone that their defense is keying on to the degree that they're keying on Steph Curry. So what I learned about Steph is something that I've already known. You can take him out of the game or marginalize him per se if you have a non peril defense with great talent on the defensive end and you have a defensive game plan that's geared solely towards stopping him. I didn't learn much. I knew that going into these finals. I keep telling people what it is. Like, I don't take any pleasure in saying that. Like, uh, we're on national TV. A lot of people watch this show. You think I want to come out, out here and say something about bad about someone? I mean, you were Steve, crowned hater of the who year. Who seems like, yeah, well, Bo that's Boston. That's different. That doesn't count. Of course I want to say bad <laughs> things about Boston. But, from New York. But, you think I want to say something, and especially when it's stuff like how they handle pressure. Because that starts to touch on or overlap with what's in someone's heart, their character, things like that. I don't want to touch that. About someone like Steph Curry, I don't want to touch that. It doesn't feel good to do it, but you got to tell the truth. Well, then tell the truth then. Or as Will Smith stated in the film Concussion, tell the truth. Let's tell the whole truth. And I've gone over this already. From Steph Curry's first appearance in the playoffs in 2013, he's always shown up. Now, the point that I think is more relevant and more pertinent is that ever since the NBA Finals in 2016, he has not been the same player in the clutch. Before those NBA Finals in 2016, he was one of the most clutch players that I had ever seen. He made a series of big shots down the stretch of games in both the regular season and the postseason prior to his performance in the 2016 Finals, which I think has left an indelible impact, an indelible mark on his mind that he still has not quite grown past or grown beyond. Because right after those Finals, they acquired Kevin Durant and Kevin Durant became the go-to guy in the clutch. So Steph Curry was never able to directly deal with his demons in the clutch and exercise those demons, at least until this playoff run. And we've seen that he's had many clutch moments against the Rockets in games five and six. I mean, he had many clutch moments against the Portland Trailblazers. People might say, well, how could you have clutch moments in a sweep? Well, in most of those games, they came down to the fourth quarter. The Golden State Warriors were down big and he was able to lead the charge along with Draymond Green. I'll also say that he's made big shots in the finals. Just this past finals in 2019 against Toronto, he made big shots. So, I mean, it depends on exactly what you define as being clutch or a great crunch time performer. Did he make that big shot that would have won the game in game six? No, he didn't. So, of course, people are going to scrutinize him for that. I get it. But let's not act like he's never made big shots in the playoffs before because that's just not true. In the 2014 playoffs, even though they lost in the first round in seven games against the Clippers, he had many standout performances. In the 2015 playoffs, when they won their first championship, he had phenomenal performances in every round of the playoffs. For some reason, Max Kellerman seems to conveniently forget those performances. In 2016, they were down three games to one, and Steph Curry showed up in games five, six, and seven. I believe that Steph had over 30 points in each of those last three games to come back against the OKC Thunder. So if we're going to talk about it, we got to talk about everything. Many 
anything, what I learned, if I learned anything in these finals, is that Steph is coming along. He showed me stuff under pressure I haven't seen before. No, that you just don't remember before, or you choose to not acknowledge. Drop. 47 when he didn't have clay and you needed offense from him he had maybe the best game of his career considering the circumstances when you won game five and he hit those big threes down the stretch so that tells me steph is coming along but was i surprised he took the last shot and missed it i knew he was gonna miss the last shot whoa i know oh. by the way remember when i said remember when i said with a fake that was an extremely difficult shot i mean literally he had to catch whirl all the way around to his left and throw up a shot over Serge Ibaka. That was not an easy shot. The last shot's not for him. He has not shown in his career that that shot is for him in the finals. Maybe he will eventually, because he can shoot it. But you know what, he shot three from 11 from three last night. Do you think he needed to hit some threes last night? Was that a good? Max Kellerman needs to explain to me, how many, how many of these players have come through the NBA where the last shot in the NBA finals was for them, other than Michael Jordan? I mean, let's just go through the list of, of big NBA Finals games where there was a player who consistently made last-second shots either tie the game or win the game. You have a Michael Jordan who did it repeatedly. I mean, he literally did it in just about every Finals game where there was a game that came down to the last possession and he was able to make a big basket. In the 1991 Finals against the LA Lakers, Game 3, he was able to make a huge shot to send the game into overtime where they won. In 1992, if I remember correctly, Game 2, which, which was a game that they lost against Portland, he was able to make a big shot to send the game into overtime. In 1997, of course, he had multiple games where he had big shots down the stretch. Game 1 against Utah, he had a game winner. Game 5, the flu game, he had a big three-point shot. So, I mean, we know about Jordan. The next year in 98, he has the classic shot over Brian Russell. So, Michael Jordan is at least one cut above everyone else, if not two cuts above everyone else. I mean, how many big shots did Kobe Bryant hit in the last second of NBA Finals games to send the game into overtime or to win the game? <laughs> you know, I mean, pivotal shots like that. He had that big game in game four against the Pacers. But other than that, he's not had these huge clutch shots. LeBron James, he has not had these huge clutch shots. So they're trying to hold Steph Curry to a standard that really has no precedent other than the great Michael Jordan. Or is it a good time to hit some threes when you got KD and Clay and Draymond and no one can beat you and everyone got their chest out? Then you can hit threes. But what about when your team needs it the most? Remember when I said Andre Iguodala, fate of the universe on the line, open shot? I want Iguodala taking that shot. You know what Iguodala shot last night? 22 points to Steph's 21. Three for six from three versus three from 11 for three. Better field goal percentage. I'm saying he can't, he's not the player Steph is, but with the money on the line, he's better. There's some players. The reason why Jalen Rose is laughing at his dumb ass is because this is an example of someone that just looks at numbers and has no idea what they're talking about. You could never ever in life compare the quality of shots that Jalen Rose gets to the quality of shots that Steph Curry gets. There's no way in the world that Nick Nurse is in the locker room saying, don't leave Andre Iguodala. Even when he doesn't have the ball, Make sure that no one leaves Andre Iguodala. I want all you guys out there on the floor, even though you're the one guarding Andre, all four of you other guys, make sure that you keep your eyes on Andre. No one has, no one has said that shit ever since Andre has been in the league. So once again, Max Kellerman shows that he has no idea what he's talking about who stay the same under pressure. Some players who get worse, some players who get better. Steph has been consistently throughout his career a lesser version of himself in the finals with the money on the line. I'm not making it up, and I don't like to say it, but the truth is the truth. But numbers don't tell everything. I understand that he's 0 for 8. Get up showed us the, the, the stat this morning where he's 0 for 8 with the final shot, the final 20 seconds, you know, in the postseason. I said nobody in the last 20 seasons has missed more shots under that level of duress, meaning... Well, I have a question. If Steph Curry is 0 for 8 in all shots under 20 seconds in the postseason, what about the shot that he hit against the New Orleans Pelicans that only had a fraction of a second left when he made that three-point shot to send it into overtime? Or does that not count because the game went into overtime? Like, that's what I mean when I talk about stats and how malleable they can be. Waning final seconds or whatever the case may be. 
What I'm saying to you is this. It still doesn't take away from the fact that he's the greatest shooter we've ever seen. It still doesn't take away from the fact that he's a three-time champion. It still doesn't take away from the fact that he did average 30 in these finals. I mean, it's not like he didn't show up. One of the things that I pulled up, I pulled up because obviously I covered, and, and the reason why I bring up Allen Iverson is because I covered Allen Iverson every day for the first 10 years of his career. I, I, I covered every game. When he went against the Lakers and he lost to the Lakers, he averaged 35.6 points. He had 48 in game one. He finished shooting 40% from the field and 28% from three-point range. What I'm trying to say is if you look at those numbers, you'll sit up there and say, volume, volume, volume. But if you watch Allen Iverson, the damn warrior that he is, you know that don't just judge it by the numbers. In other words, Stephen A. Smith, you're a fanboy. And this is my issue with Allen Iverson fanboys. They always try to separate the shooting percentages and the shot jacking from the productivity. Without a doubt, Allen Iverson, if we're just going to gauge talent and natural ability, is one of the top five, if not top three players to ever play in the NBA. But as a basketball player, <laughs> he was very toxic, and his fan base can be very toxic as well. So as a result, we all, how, what do we often say? What do you often say about Allen Iverson? Pound for pound, what he is. So, so, so in other words, you have to take into account the limitations. One of the reasons why we've judged, whether it's KD at one point in time, whether it's LeBron at another time or whatever, don't know. one of the reasons we judge them so harshly is because it's not just the skill set, but the level of physicality that they have that's to the advantage. Agreed. If you are an undersized individual, the level of the rest that's pointing in your direction, particularly in those waning moments, are very, very difficult to overcome physically. That's why, for example, we co we crucify the Portland Trailblazers for drafting Sam Bowie ahead of Michael Jordan. Do you notice no one has ever said a word about Akeem Olajuwon getting drafted ahead of Michael Jordan? Do you know why? Because he won two championships and he was probably the best player of the mid-90s while Jordan was out. And he was arguably the second best player of that entire era from 85 to 2000. Teach seven feet. That's why. We knew he could ball. He was uh, ultimately ended up being a two-time champion. The two titles that Akeem and Dream Olajuwon won in his career was when Michael Jordan retired from baseball to one full season, and then he came back the second season with 17 games left. You can't teach seven feet. You can't teach size. You can't teach girth. You can't teach those things. So when I look at a guy like Steph Curry, and I look at his greatness as a shooter. I also understand his limitations. You ain't gonna be Kawhi, you ain't gonna be KD, you ain't gonna be did LeBron he or Anthony. Never look at three because he can shoot. He did, yeah, but I'm just saying. He, he, yeah, all right, he missed that shot. But what I'm Yo, saying is that no, shot. Well, again, but no. That's just not accurate. He does not always miss that shot. As I've already stated, he hit that big shot against New Orleans in the 2015 playoffs. But for whatever reason, that seems to not show up in their analytics probably because that game went into overtime. Oh, that, that shot isn't always available. It was last night, but that shot isn't always you available. Have a good and, look. and so all I'm trying to say to you is this. Let's pump the brakes on it. At the end of the day, we understand why the Warriors went into these NBA Finals as the reigning two-time defending NBA champions. It was because of KD. If it wasn't for KD, they wouldn't have been the reigning two-time defending NBA champions. We know that Steph is great. We know that he's one of the greatest shooter that I've ever seen. But in a certain... He's right there with Larry Bird. Respect. There are certain limitations that you are going to have when you are that guy in playing in a league where you got great, great, phenomenal players, six, seven, six, eight, and above. This is the way it goes. I got to ask you, um, great basketball minds, a couple of questions based <laughs> on what you said. So basically, you feel like Steph is a front runner. 